Thanks for the kind introduction, uh, and thanks for the uh, opportunity to talk today at, at FATML. Um, let's see, so I want to mention some people before I get started. Uh, so Yin Lu was a grad student at Cornell. Uh, this became Yin's thesis. Oh, Yin is here. So Yin, wave, say hello. So, so half of what I'm going to present is, is Yin's work. Uh, Sarah Tan is another Cornell grad student. Uh, she's a stat student. And some of the new stuff that I'll show at the end of the presentation will be work that Sarah and I, bought, Sarah and I have done this summer. And then a number of other people, Johannes, who used to be at Cornell, but we stole him. Uh, some people from uh, Microsoft and some people from uh, New York Presbyterian Hospital in Columbia and then a bunch of other people who have contributed to, uh, to some of the papers. OK. Let's just jump right in. And I'm going to start with a sort of motivational story. Some of you might have seen this part of the presentation before. Uh, but the second half of the presentation is all new. So, so bear with me. OK. So I've done a lot of work in machine learning for healthcare, And uh, you've always got this question. You know, you've got uh, data for millions of patients. You've got thousands of great features. Uh, you're good at machine learning, you train some state-of-the-art model, maybe it's a neural net. You get this you know, unbelievable ROC, 0.95, which never really happens in healthcare data. Uh, and now the question is, is it safe to go ahead and deploy this model and use it on real patients? Is, is this high accuracy that you get on test data, is that sufficient to make you confident in the model? And of course, what you've really got is just this black box, right? If that was a neural net, you, you don't have much idea what's going on inside. You know its I.O. behavior looks like it's very accurate on test data, but you don't really know how it's making its decisions inside. And I'm going to show you that that can be a problem, that there can be surprises in this black box. And uh, I guess people in this community, everybody in this room will already sort of be nodding their head, of course. So, so let me tell you how I got involved in this. So back when I was a grad student at CMU in the mid-'90s, uh, I got asked to be part of this study where, so, so everyone in the room, you have pneumonia, okay? You've already been diagnosed with pneumonia. And the goal is for us to try to predict if you're high risk or low risk. And if you're low risk from pneumonia, you, the proper treatment really is sort of chicken soup, antibiotics, call us in three days if you're not feeling better. You don't want to be in the hospital if you're low risk and there are effective treatments for you as an outpatient. But if you're high risk, you absolutely need to be in the hospital. You know, about 10% of the people in this study died from their pneumonia. So it's a very serious condition if you're high risk. So, so you need to be in the hospital. And uh, part of our goal in this project was to train the various machine learning methods we had available to us in the mid-90s uh, and see which ones would be best at predicting pneumonia risk. Um, and I got lucky. Uh, at the time, I was developing multitask learning. And the multitask neural nets that I trained on the problem turned out to be the most accurate model that any of us could train on this data set. So I, I sort of won the jackpot, which, which was great. Um, and then at some point, there was a question, well, should we consider using this on real patients? Uh, and I said, no, we should not use a black box neural net on, on patients. Uh, and instead, they, they went forward using logistic regression, you know, the most conservative uh, and not quite as accurate model that we use in healthcare all the time. So now the question is, why did I stop them from using this neural net? And why did we use logistic regression instead? A friend who was a grad student at another university working on the same data learned a rule one night, which is that if you have asthma, history of asthma, it lowers your chance of dying from pneumonia. OK, now that should seem a little surprising, right? You don't have to know much healthcare to question that asthma would be like protective from pneumonia. It's, it's not, by the way. <laughs> so we asked the doctors at the next meeting. And the doctors you know, thought about it. And they said, it's probably a real pattern in the data. Um, they said, we consider asthma a very serious risk factor for pneumonia patients. Uh, so they get really aggressive treatment once they get to us. You know, in, in fact, they often would have been admitted directly to critical care uh, back in the mid-'90s. So they get really good treatment. And then. Think about it. If you've got a history of asthma, you already pay attention to how you're breathing, right? And if you're starting to come down with pneumonia, you're going to notice very quickly that you're having more trouble breathing than is usual. You've probably got a doctor since you're an asthmatic. So you call the doctor up, uh, and the doctor says, ooh, an asthmatic who's having a lot of trouble breathing. They get into the office quicker, and then they diagnose what's happening to you, and you, you get treatment faster. So those are all wonderful things if you have pneumonia. You notice the symptoms earlier. You call healthcare sooner. You get an appointment fast. 
And then when you get there, they treat it very seriously, figure out what's wrong with you, and they give you, you know, like magic antibiotics earlier. So for an infection, those are all great things. And it is true that, in fact, the asthmatics in the data set have a lower probability of death because of the speed and quality of the care that they receive relative to the general population. Now the problem is we were going to use the model to try to decide who should we admit to the hospital or not. So if we use this rule-based system, the rule-based system would sort of suggest, ah, the asthmatic's probably OK. Don't send them to the hospital, right? right. So, so the exact opposite of the great care that they're receiving, <laughs> which is making them low risk. Now I assume if the rule-based system learned that asthma is good for you, that my neural net must have learned it as well. Because in fact, it's a real pattern in the data. OK, now that we know to look for it, you can go to the stats in the data, and you see that this is a real pattern. So the neural net probably learned it as well from the same data set. So if we were to use this neural net for, decision, uh, for admission decisions, it, it could hurt asthmatics as well, just like the rule-based system would. But here we might not know we have the problem, where at least in the rule-based system, we knew we had a problem. Um, now, the key to discovering this asthma problem was how intelligible this class of models is, not how intelligible the neural net is. So, so that's kind of a problem. Um, and I told them, I said, you know, now that I know there's a problem, I could probably make this asthma thing go away in the neural net, do some more research, publish another paper or two. I said, what really scares me is what else did the neural net learn that might be equally wrong, but the rule-based system didn't learn it, and therefore I don't know that I have this other problem that I need to solve. And I said, it's because of these other things that we don't know about what's happening in the neural net that we really shouldn't deploy it and use it on, on real people. OK. So that's what got me involved in this 25 years ago. OK. So and it's been a thorn in my side ever since. Um, <laughs> and finally, we have something we can do about it. All right, so before I jump into what we're going to do about it, let's just talk a little bit about what we're observing here. So first of all, the data is collected. And it's collected for some purpose, either because it's easy to collect, because you're part of some study, who knows what. We're going to go ahead and use this data for some purpose for which it was not a randomized clinical trial, right? So what would be the proper randomized clinical trial to know whether asthmatics need to be in the hospital or not? Well, you would send half of the asthmatics home. You'd send half of them to the hospital, <laughs> right? <laughs> so you know you have to break a few eggs in order to make a good model. Uh, so, but we're, we're obviously not going to do that, right? It's, it's not ethical to do this. We, we would never subject patients to improper health care intentionally just to help our machine learning model you know, be 1% more accurate. So most real data sets, as you'll see as we look later on, have these landmines in it. Okay? We didn't expect this asthma problem to be in the data. We just observed it. And I'll show you in uh, five or six slides, I'll show you that there are actually more landmines in the data than, than we expected than this uh, that the rule-based system didn't pick up on. So, so this is a problem you have to deal with whenever you're doing modeling from a complex data set. Now you might say, oh, well, you just need to understand and fix your data. And sometimes that's possible. But I think that's actually too hard. If you think about a complex data set, you know, there are maybe a thousand different things you could learn from any interesting complex data set. To understand the data is like being able to understand all of those thousand things that you could learn from the data at the same time. That's, that's pretty hard. So we're going to adopt a much lower bar, which is we're going to just try to understand the model that you've trained on the data for some purpose. So and that's going to be much, much easier. It's going to focus your attention much better. So, so that's what we're going to do. Uh, and as I'll show you, that's, that's reasonably possible. I think it should be obvious from what I'm saying that I believe if you're going to use models in critical applications like healthcare, autonomous vehicles, nuclear power plant management, you know, anything like that, I think it's just very, very important that you can understand what's inside those models. Otherwise, it's going to make mistakes that would really surprise you. And it's going to turn out, as I'll show you later, some of the mistakes it makes are actually the easiest cases, not the hardest cases. Um, same story, by the way, goes for race, gender, socioeconomic bias. And I'll show you a bunch of new results that we have at the second half of the talk uh, on using this kind of modeling for, for Compass. So, OK. Well, all we really need to solve this problem would be a model that was accurate and at the same time intelligible. I want accuracy because I want all that accuracy of my neural net. And I want intelligible so that I can see what it's learned. 
the problems are often in the data. So it's not that I think machine learning is broken. It's that the data is often broken. So I need intelligibility not to understand why machine learning screwed up. I need it to understand why the data really isn't perfect for what I'm trying to do. Okay? So I want these things. Now, of course, there tends to be this trade-off, right, which is that the highest accuracy models, you know, boosted trees, deep neural nets, random forests, unfortunately tend not to be very intelligible. And the models that are intelligible, things like naive Bayes and logistic regression and simple decision trees, it, it turns out those things typically are not high flyers in terms of accuracy. So what we're looking for is something in this sort of magic corner that is both uh, high accuracy and high intelligibility. And to our surprise, uh, Yin, I, and and some other people have actually had some success in, in getting an algorithm that's up here. So not for every data set, but, but for many data sets. So I'll tell you about that. So let me go through this space of model possibilities, model complexity. So at the easy end, we have things like linear regression, right? So this is a weight times a feature plus a weight times a feature. Very simple model, relatively intelligible. Not all that accurate, maybe, but, but very intelligible. At the other extreme, we have these full complexity models, right? It's just some function of all the avail available features. Okay, so that could be anything. That could be uh, a deep neural net, boosted trees, random forest. Okay. Fortunately, there's a space in between, and one of these is additive models. So this is a function of feature one plus a function of feature n. So these are functions of individual features. Notice that this is not a function of n features. It's a function of one feature at a time. That function can be arbitrarily complex. It could be multimodal, you know, sinusoidal, could, could do anything. Um, but it's still always a function of one feature at a time, and then you sum those, those functions. Now, it can get a little more complicated than that. This sum over i of functions of individual features, that's that sum right there. We could also have a sum over pairs of features, ij, of functions of those pairs of features. This can now handle pairwise interactions. And then we could go to three-way interactions, uh, functions of triples, and, and we could go all the way. If we go all the way, we eventually have a model class that's equivalent to that. And what we're going to do is we're going to restrict ourselves to just functions of individual features and functions of a few important pairs of features, a few pairwise interactions. So that's the model space we're going to restrict ourselves to. We're restricting ourselves to this model space mainly because it remains interpretable transparent. We, we can understand these, these functions if we do it carefully. And it'll turn out, to our surprise, we're able to get a lot of accuracy out of these things. So, so that's why we're going to use this function space. Uh, we didn't invent this. Uh, statisticians are very smart. They invented them even before we got involved in this project. So in the late 80s, early 90s, statisticians came up with generalized additive models. That's what these are. Uh, so statisticians invented these a long time ago. And what we're bringing that's new is we're bringing sort of machine learning techniques and computer horsepower to the problem of fitting generalized additive models. So, so that's really what we're bringing. And in the process, we're going to be able to make them, one, I think, more interpretable, which is remarkable. But we're also going to be able to make them a lot more accurate. In fact, so accurate that they now compete with other methods like random forests and neural nets. So, but statisticians, got to remember, these guys invented, they, they literally wrote the book. Uh, on these things uh, around 1990. So these have been around a long, long time. OK, I'm going to skip all the technical details of the algorithm. <laughs> uh, feel free to ask me about it. There are papers, and you know, we can talk about it. We believe there are probably many ways to achieve the kind of model I'm going to show you. What's most important is that you get to see what the model can do and how to use this kind of model. And then our algorithm is pretty good, but there are probably other algorithms for doing the same thing. So, so I'm going to not bore you with the details of, of our algorithm. Will you tell us what the F says? Uh, what yes. In fact, in, in fact, you'll see one in a, in a second. Yes, yes, yeah. No, no, that's good. OK. Uh, so I got permission once we, uh, the, I mean, I really was motivated to start this work because of this problem with the pneumonia data back in the mid-90s and not being able to use that neural net. After we got these things working pretty well, I got permission to go back and use that medical data set. So we, we developed the method, and then we applied it to this pneumonia data again. And uh, so this is what that data set looks like. Back then, it was a pretty big data set. By modern standards, it's not so big. About 15,000 patients. We got 46 features. The model is going to have a function of each of those features. So there'll be 46 functions. 
And then we're going to allow 10 pairwise interactions into the model. So there'll be 10 more functions of pairs of features. And I'll, I'll show you some of these. So, so you'll see what these things are. And our goal is to predict a probability of death. What's your chance that you might die from your pneumonia? So, so that's what we're going to do. So now I'm going to show you one of the terms. So, so that, whoops, I'm sorry. Uh, these are the features. <laughs> There's lots of different features, uh, you know, heart rate, blood pressure, measures of your blood, results of some uh, doctor looking at your x-ray, things like that. And what I'm going to do is, uh, so again, this will, each one of these will become a, a function. And we're going to just look at one of them, which is age, which I don't even know if that's on the, on the table there. Okay. So I'm going to spend five minutes looking at this graph so that you understand it. So this is risk, probability of death uh, for patients who have pneumonia as a function of age. So this is age. It goes from 18 to a little over 100. You had to be an adult to be in this study. Uh, the bottom here, by the way, this is just a histogram of our patients. So you can see most of our patients are between, let's say, 60 years old and 90 years old. That's the bulk of the patients. But we have patients you know, all the way down to 18 and even a few patients above 100. So this is risk for those patients as learned by the model. Okay. And the way risk works is uh, if we add plus 1 to your risk, we kind of double your probability of death. So you don't want to be positive. If we subtract one from your risk, that's, that's good. That means your probability of death is sort of cut in half. So if the baseline rate is 10% and we add plus one, then it's a 20% chance of death for you. Uh, and if we add minus one to your risk, then it's only a 5% chance of risk for you, according to this one graph. And the way we use the model is uh, we go to each of these 56 graphs. You look up your age, see what the graph says, write down a number. Go to your blood pressure graph, find your blood pressure, write down a number. Go to your respiration rate graph, find your respiration ra rate, write down a number. You'll end up with 56 numbers. Most of them will be between plus and minus 1. Add them all up. The more negative it is, the lower risk you are. The more positive it is, the higher risk. 1 over 1 e to the minus x squared, you got a probability. So it's just like logistic regression, and this is just like log odds. OK, so now let's look at what the model has learned. Okay, and these are pseudo error bars that come from a bagging procedure. So they give you a sort of rough estimate of confidence. Let's see. It's good to be young. So, and the model seems to think that young sort of is anybody less than about 50 years old. So it doesn't really bother to distinguish between people who are 20, 30, in their 40s. It just thinks they're all young. So, so and it's good, good to be young. It lowers your risk. So, so that's nice. It's not too bad to be a little older than that. Sort of risk goes up slowly as you go from 50 to 60 to 65. So that, that's not too bad. Um, risk sort of rises a bit sharply here at about 67, 68. In a data set from the mid-90s, that's retirement age. So what the model is detecting is that for some reason, it's really a shame that retirement is bad for you, apparently. <laughs> right? you, you might hope that things got better when you retired. Um, so so one, one doctor I showed this to said, oh, we set retirement age at exactly the right age. <laughs> so <laughs> I think the causal error goes the other way. Um, a lot of things happen when you retire, right? Your insurance provider probably changes. Your daily activity changes. How often you see people change. Maybe you go on that you know, great Himalayan vacation. Uh, yeah, you know, who knows what happens? But whatever it is, unfortunately, it seems to be not as good for you, at least not from a pneumonia point of view. Then risk continues to rise fairly steeply as you go sort of 70 through your 70s into the 80s. Okay? And I think that's to be expected. Then there's some interesting things here. There's a rise, a sharp rise in risk at about 85, 86. Then it's kind of level, which is interesting all by itself. And then there's a drop in risk at about 101, which is also sort of surprising. Now, the error bars are getting pretty big out here, so you might think that drop's not real. And when I first saw it, I thought, oh, it's not real. It's just error bars. It turns out we've seen this now in multiple data sets, right at the 100, 101, 102 boundary. So we, we're now pretty sure that this is, is real, in fact. So let's talk about these things. So first of all, why a rise in risk at 85, 86? There's nothing, the doctors assure me there is nothing in the healthcare code that says we should treat 86 year olds differently than 84 year olds. Right? It's, it's, it's not like they're getting substandard care, at least not because of, of policy. We think it's purely a social effect, which is, especially in the early 90s when this data was collected, you know, upper 80s was considered pretty old. 
And we think it's one of those things where, you know, grandpa's 87, grandpa's had two rounds of antibiotics, he's very sick, he's got other problems. Maybe we shouldn't fight so hard and we should let grandpa pass. So when we think it's purely a social effect, and it's not that doctors are to blame for this, right? We don't know whether it's doctors helping to make this decision, the patients themselves, patient's spouse possibly, or patient's children. We, we don't know who is involved in this decision making, but we think this jump in risk that happens right at that round number, 85 to 86, we think that it's really a social effect that has to do with, with us basically deciding, you know, you're on the old side of old, maybe we shouldn't fight quite as hard to pull you back from the edge. Yeah? I mean, in the UK, we had a scandal around pneumonia being coded differently around hip replacements. Mm -hmm. The hospitals that had people who were dying because of hip replacements being coded as death from pneumonia. Oh, I so, see. That's uh, interesting. So could it be something to do with the coding of the label? Because that's what we really found in the UK. It was a huge national it's, scandal. It's, it's a great question, and I could easily believe that if there was this kind of coding problem that it would cause this sort of thing. Although you'd still have to figure out why did the coding suddenly change at exactly 85, 86. In this data, I don't believe it's a coding error, only because it was a pneumonia specialist who was involved in setting up the study and collecting this data. So they got it right. But I can't personally vouch for the data. But, but it's a really good question. Sometimes you do see effects like this because of effects that are happening in other variables that might seem more natural at a certain age and then somehow we don't observe it until we see it in this variable. Maybe the other variable is not even in the data set. So. It, it definitely could be something like that. In, in, in fact, here's another explanation that I've, that I've heard is, I don't think it applies to this data set, but imagine uh, Imagine a patient who's 85 years old versus a patient who's 87 years old. Perhaps if we go back to their childhood, perhaps this is when they started giving some inoculation versus not giving the inoculation, and maybe we're seeing a signature, a long-term consequence of some very early treatment, perhaps, that would have affected individuals differently depending on when they were born. So it could be something else. Uh, so this is certainly not causally you know, well understood. We suspect it's a social effect, but it actually could be something else. And it is, the tr it is the case that sometimes when we see jumps or weird things in graphs, once you dig deeper, you find it's something else that's causing it. So, so I think this is a great, great comment. Yeah. Okay, so maybe or maybe not, this is a social effect. We're pretty sure that one is a social effect. It's not that they had some magic inoculation 100 years ago <laughs> that was protective and then they stopped using it uh, for some reason, as far as we know. We think it's, uh, you made it to 100, we're not going to give up on you now. Let, let's go for it. Let's go for 101. Let's go for 102. We think, again, it's a social effect. And again, we don't know, we, <laughs> we, 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 we don't know who's making the decision, right? It, it could be doctors. It could be the patient themselves. Possible there's still a spouse in the picture. More likely it's uh, children and grandchildren perhaps making this decision. But somehow it looks like a little extra effort goes into people once they've passed this you know, magic round number. Uh, so in, and it's good for them. The extra effort pays off. And you know, it's a difference of about uh, 0.1 maybe. And that sort of cuts your probability of death. If it was 10%, it cuts it to 9%. So, so it's... <laughs> right, right, right. In, in fact, the trick is to is to pretend you're 105 and not retired <laughs> and, to <have> never <laughs> and to have never gone through 85 somehow. Right, right. So, um, OK, so, so this flat spot is kind of interesting. It's just sort of a surprise that risk isn't continuing to rise. And uh, like David Heckerman suggested, well, maybe this is uh, because of what's called successful agers, people who have very good genes that mean they're not likely to uh, you know, have cancer or die of heart disease or, or diabetes and those things. And they're actually you know, pretty healthy and they're just slowly aging and eventually something will, will get them. But, uh, but maybe the risk doesn't really rise as quickly here. Whereas these people on average may not have the healthy gene set that, that people who have made it into their 90s have. We, we don't really know if any of that is true. Adam. Oh, good, good, good. Okay, I'm glad you asked that. Okay, so what we are doing is we're fitting a model that has 56 graphs in it. 
we're fitting all of these risk plots all at the same time. So we're fitting the risk as a function of age, the risk as a function of cancer, the risk as a function of blood pressure, all at the same time. And the way you use them is, this is just a single additive piece of your predicted risk. So if the model says you're 70, if, if you're 70, the model says add 0 to your score. If you're 90, the model says add 0.35 to your score. If you're 40, the model says subtract 0.3 to your score. It, it, it's definitely a possibility. Now the beauty is we can see all of these other things and if age is the variable that most explains what's happening to you, it's actually most likely to show up in this graph, we, we believe. But it is definitely all, there's correlation among all these variables. So that means nothing's truly independent in a complex data set. So it is possible that other things like it's your blood pressure is what's showing that you're high risk and that age is no longer capturing that because r risk of blood pressure as a function of age is less important than the risk of dying from pneumonia as a function of blood pressure. Yes, yeah, that, that's definitely possible. So w one thing, uh, let, let me make the point now, I usually say it later, is it's not the case that this model or this graph should be viewed as being true. Okay, it's not like this is some true statement about risk as a function of age for pneumonia. If we were to add or subtract other variables, uh, as Adam's suggesting, the risk graph will change. Okay, for example, one thing the risk graph tells us is it'd be nice to have another variable which just said whether you're retired or not. Because not everybody retires at 67, 68, right? So it'd be nice to have another variable for retirement to catch people who retire early, people who retire later. If we had that variable, this rapid rise that happens right here would disappear. The graph would look different because now most of the retirement effect would be caught on that other variable if we could add it to the data set. And this would have exactly the kind of effect Adam's suggesting, right? If, if one of these other variables sort of magically went away, then maybe the risk here would pop up because it was no longer being captured by, by the other variables. Yes, yeah, thank, thank you. Intensivity of Right, right, right. No, no, this is, this is, a, this is the, the million dollar question, which is we're thinking of using the model to predict something that will then lead to an intervention, right? We're thinking of saying if your probability of death is high, we will admit you, and if your probability of death is low, we won't admit you. And this model does not have a feature in it that knows whether the patient was or was not admitted to the hospital. Okay, so it's not able to learn from the care that was received by these patients whether the care is a critical variable or not. So, so and this is a limitation. It turns out for, say, the asthma problem, okay, most of the asthmatics did get uh, admitted to the hospital, it turns out, in this data set. It turns out we don't have enough data for asthmatics who weren't admitted to really know uh, what would have happened to them if they were admitted or not admitted. And it's not ethical, of course, for us to send more of them home. So it turns out in that case, we would never actually have enough data about asthmatics who were not admitted to, to know what the model should or shouldn't predict for, for non-admission for asthmatics. Um, so, and it's important also to note the model is not trying to predict uh, what current practice is, what, what doctors are doing to these patients. What they, they want this model to be an extra, an auxiliary, you know, evidence-based practice of medicine kind of model which independently of physicians makes a prediction based on something like probability of death to give them some extra information that's not just something trying to do what they're already doing. So, so they don't really want us to be predicting uh, whether they put the patient into the hospital or not. They want us to predict whether the patient is high risk or not and then they'll use that as part of the decision to put them into the hospital. This doesn't answer all the questions that could arise. Um, and one way to sort of solve some of these problems would be to better model the effect of the treatment that the patients have received. It's interesting though, a lot of times all the problems don't go away when you do that and you're still left with, with surprising difficulties. So, but but that's, a, that's a complicated story that we could spend a lot of time uh, trying to figure out. Okay, so it's an interesting model. It even sort of suggests that we might want another variable here. Uh, there's interesting stories here. Uh, that may or may not be due to good genes. Here's an interesting thing about this model. It's just as accurate as the neural net. 
which is the most accurate other model we could train in the data. In fact, it's slightly more accurate than the neural net, but they're within noise of each other. So this model, which has 46 plus 10 of these graphs, is a really accurate model. And yet, we just spent sort of 10 minutes talking about what this model might or might not be able to teach us about risk as a function of age for pneumonia, which is something I assume the neural net inside has learned something vaguely like this spread among its, its 10 million weights. But I don't know exactly how to find it. Whereas this model is this simple that we can just understand it and we can sort of draw, try to draw conclusions or try to figure out why different uh, things that we see in the graphs are, are happening. Um, it's even causing us to think about like causal effects. Not, this is not a causal model, but, but it's making us think about things causally in the world. Where I don't know when the last time you trained a neural net and then you know, left with 10 causal questions that you needed to go, go answer. You know, I don't know when that happened to you. Here's another thing about this model. This is the model. The red line is the model. This is not a proxy for some other more complicated thing sitting on disk. Okay, while it is true that millions of trees were killed <laughs> in the process of generating this model, we throw all the trees away. The graph is the model. There is nothing else hidden behind the scenes. This model can really be 56 pieces of paper. On each piece of paper, you find the patient's variable value, write down the number, go to the next piece of paper, do it again, get 56 numbers, add them together, one over one of the x squared, you've got the answer. Okay, so, so this really is the model. So, so it's an amazingly accurate model, uh, and it's an amazingly transparent model. And I don't want to say it's a correct model, but at least you know exactly how it is making its predictions. There's no ambiguity about what it's doing. You might not know why it's doing it, right? But, but there's no ambiguity here. There, there's no other questions. Okay, so remember there's uh, 46 graphs like this in the in the data set. So let's talk about some of the things it's learned. Well, I've already mentioned, you know, it's better to be 105 than 95, uh, and we probably should have a retirement variable added to the data set if we can do that. First thing I did when I got permission to retrain the model on, on that data was, does it still think asthma is good for you? And, and I was hoping it was, because realize that's not a mistake that learning is making, it's a problem in the data. So if the model's any good, it will learn that asthma is good for you, and sure enough, it thinks asthma is good for you. So, so that's great, right? <laughs> um, this is what's interesting. The model also thinks that a history of chest pain and a history of heart disease are good for you. In fact, a history of heart disease is better for you than asthma. So you <laughs> <laughs> presumably it's exactly the same effect, right? If you have a history of heart disease and chest pain and you suddenly notice you're having trouble breathing, right? I assume you're going to notice very soon that something's wrong. You're going to call the doctor very quickly. They're going to give you an appointment or send you to the ER. You're going to get diagnosed faster, and you're going to receive great care. And that, that's the wonderful story for pneumonia. You're actually going to have a better chance of survival because of the speed and quality of care that you're going to get. What's unfortunate is the rule-based system never detected those things. So we were, you know, it's very good that we didn't deploy that neural net back in the mid-90s. Um, the worst thing that could have happened to you is that you were an asthmatic, heart disease, chest pain, 105-year-old, right? <laughs> and, and the model would have said, you know, go, go to Everest, climb the Alps. You know, you're, you're golden. Don't worry about the fact that you're having trouble breathing. There's, there's nothing wrong with you, right? right? So, so um, but these models, um, we can really understand what they've learned. Uh, to some extent, and we can fix them when they've made mistakes. We can actually remove these effects, and we'll talk a little bit about that, um, and we can fix that problem where, you know, 105-year-olds are less risk than 95-year-olds. So, so we can edit the model. Yeah. Right, right, right. I mean, this is the, the classic correlation in high dimensional data problem. Now, we know if, all of, if there was no correlation and all these uh, measurements, all these variables were, were independent of each other, then of course you could do exactly what you were suggesting we can't do. You could actually go to each term individually and see what its impact is. 
Because of correlation, you are 100% correct that we cannot necessarily conclude what any one graph's effect is. And I think this goes to Adam's question as well. We really can't pretend that there is no correlation among these terms and that any one graph should be interpreted in the absence of the others. And that's why I say, you know, what we see in the graphs kinds of leads us to questions that make us further investigate things. And some of those are causal questions and some are not. Um, but it would be wrong to think that a graph is right or that what it's saying is true about the world. Because if we were to add or subtract other features to the data set and rerun, things will move up and, up and down. Yes, yes. So uh, we have not solved, uh, I mean, I used to think when I started this project that uh, uh, interaction was like the nightmare. Uh, now, interaction is trivial. It's, it's correlation is from the devil. I mean, correlation is really what makes things so difficult when you want to make statements of, about the world. So, so I think your point is exactly correct. Uh, we do not have a magic solution uh, to correlation, especially as the dimensionality gets high and the number of correlated variables gets high. Um, in practice, in practice, the models seem to work pretty well, but, but you know, that's a very hand-wavy statement. I, I mean, can't take that to the bank. Yeah? Um, follow up on Alex's question. Uh, but it seems to be worried, since you're sort of introducing a mechanism for model fixing, that someone will make yeah. a mistake and say, oh, this isn't what it should look like. I'll, I'll pick the part of the model by hand. Right, and right, right. Feel like the model is better, but it's, it might be both more accurate and sort of like spuriously correct. Right, so, so the model fixing I haven't talked about much here. Um, but we are imagining that a human expert would go in and say, oh, no, no, we're going to use this to help admit patients. We do not want the model to think that patients who are above 100 are lower risk. Therefore, we'll redraw the line above 100. And then if we're actually wrong in our interpretation because of correlation, then we'll have not fixed the model. We'll have made it more broken. Right? So, so that's the fundamental problem. Um, we do not have a perfect solution to this. In fact, we're de developing tools right now that we think will make it easier to understand when you see these jumps in the model how much they're real and independent of other variables versus how much they're in some sort of correlation storm and you really are sort of confused and, and don't know how to interpret them. Yes. Um, it does turn out the age one when we go look at the data and do the regular kind of statistical analysis that you would do once you know you have a problem it does look like the age one is real uh, and that we would want to fix it. But that's because we've done extra side analysis beyond what the model has shown us to try to understand that and then to try to fix it. And that side analysis is not necessarily trivial. As any of you know who work on this sort of thing, uh, these, these can be very complicated, hard, hard problems. But we are trying to develop a toolkit, which I won't talk about today, uh, which would make it easier to understand what's real and also what the best way to fix it is. So, so this is a good discussion. Yeah. Uh-oh. <laughs> sub one is are you going to answer form how do you pick F sub i's for all the variables? What is the functional form they show? The second one is No, go ahead. <laughs> two in, uh, sorry, ten interactions out of about two thousand or so uh -huh. potential ones. So it's uh -huh. was there some magic or sure. Go ahead. That yep, that's a good one. And the last one is what is the difference in the model quality if we were to drop just interaction terms? So just keep recording. Gotcha, gotcha. Oh, okay, good, good, good questions. Um, and we'll talk more about interactions in a second because I'll show you some. Um, let's see. Under the hood, there is a very constrained form of boosted trees that dis depends on things like boosted stumps or boosted two-level trees that can only use two variables at a time. So this is what's under the hood. There's a whole bunch of details to how that works. It's multiple KDD papers from previous conferences. So I won't go into the detail, but I'm happy to talk with anybody. And Yin would also be happy to talk with anybody who's interested in this afterwards. I, I mean, you, you know, we really like that stuff. Um, so the interactions, we have a fast algorithm that we developed, uh, part of Yin's thesis, for uh, heuristically estimating the importance of a pair. It's a very fast algorithm, so we can afford to look at all order n squared pairs of features. It sorts the features, and then we do just simple cross-validation to figure out if the first five, the first 10, first 20, you know, how many we should include in the model. Um, and last question was again about interact. Oh, if we were to, oh, oh, the accuracy difference. Okay, it depends very much on the data set. There are some data sets for which interactions really aren't that important and we get almost all of the accuracy from the main effects. 
There are other data sets for which you get sort of, if, if this is logistic regression and this is boosted trees and neural nets, without interaction, with just main effects, you get about this far. And then it's the interactions that bring you up to here, you know, being close to these other methods. Uh, but it's very much problem dependent. The, every now and then there's a problem where a three-way interaction would be useful. But we're surprised how often we achieve the accuracy of other methods without ever going beyond a small number of pairwise interactions. So, so good, good, good questions. Okay, so an important thing about these models is, you know, it really is like having some magic pair of glasses. I mean, you would train a neural net, you get high accuracy, you deploy it, you're happy. And then if you could suddenly see inside the neural net, it's like, oh my God, you know, every, every fifth person is a space alien, you, you, you know. Uh, there are suddenly landmines in the data that the model has learned that you really need to at a minimum understand before you deploy and in many cases fix. So and this is things like heart disease, chest pain and, and asthma. You, you really have to fix those things before you deploy them. It, it's funny too, often we see that the mistakes the model makes are on the easiest cases because those are the cases for which there are effective interventions already in healthcare. So they're the, you know, we have good treatments for some of these things. So those are the things which uh, you didn't even bother to record the variables because they're just standard good quality healthcare. They have a big impact because the healthcare is effective and it suddenly turns out the model can see that effectiveness and it suddenly thinks that it's actually good and it, it goes ahead and, uh, and, and models it. Um, so often these, mo often mo the, the very models you're training often are making their biggest mistakes on the easiest cases where the model should not be allowed to make those mistakes. And it's just because the data is not quite as clean as you thought the data was for your purpose. I'll talk more about that in a second. Model correctness. Okay, so I said we were going to use the model to decide who to admit to the hospital. We absolutely have to fix the model before we do that. Otherwise, we're going to hurt asthmatics with heart disease and people who are elderly. Suppose instead of using the model to decide who to admit to the hospital, suppose instead we were a uh, insurance provider. So we were interested in an actuarial kind of thing, like what's the chance that the patient will survive? because we have to keep around enough funds for their health care in the future if they're going to survive. So we're, we're very interested in what percentage of patients will survive or, or not survive. It turns out the model, which I showed you, which thinks that, uh, thinks that being 105 is lower risk, turns out that's a perfect model from an actuarial point of view. Because that model is not going to intervene in the world, right? The insurance model, hopefully, <laughs> is not going to intervene. Healthcare will run its course, which is what this is modeling, and it will turn out to be true that, in fact, the very elderly have a, have a better chance of survival than people who are not quite as, as elderly. And from an actuarial point of view, that, that's correct. So it turns out this is exactly the right model from an actuarial point of view. It's just a wrong model from an admit patients to the hospital point of view. What does that tell us? It tells us that the correctness of the model and the correctness of the data that the model was trained on, the, mo the data is not right or wrong. The model has actually learned real stuff from the data that's interesting to know. But the correctness or usefulness of the model, its risk, depends on what you're going to do with it. For one use, it's actually the perfect model, say an actuarial use. And for a different purpose, just admitting patients by probability of death, by risk, it actually needs, needs serious repair. So that's a very important thing to know. And then my understanding is there was a discussion this morning about, you know, could we fix the problem by taking away the asthma, heart disease, chest pain variables? All right, that's a bad idea. That's a terrible, terrible idea. So, so why? Well, it turns out there is correlation between these variables and the other variables that are in the data set. And remember, I said the problem is in the data. It's actually in the labels of the data. Okay, the asthmatics really do have, have a better probability uh, uh, of surviving. If you remove the variables, the model will, through correlation, still try to get its asthma, chest pain, heart disease fix. It'll still try to predict that those patients are low risk through correlation. Now it'll be spread among the other variables that you left in the data set in some complicated way that you'll probably never understand. And it'll be much harder to repair even if you know that the problem is there. Okay, so the the surprising thing is you must take the features that you think are most scary, like this might be race, uh, gender, you know, socioeconomic class, asthma, heart disease. You absolutely have to leave those variables in the model. See what the model has learned about them. See what the bias is in the data set. 
and then do your best to surgically remove it after the fact. So, so that's the approach that we would use now with this, with this model class. Very, very important. Okay, so pairwise interactions. Most people are familiar with parity, right? It's the, uh, it's the extreme pairwise interaction. If I tell you one of the bits of parity or the other bit, I give you no information. But if I give you both of the bits, suddenly you can compute parity perfectly. So that's a sort of classic extreme interaction. Here's an interaction that the model learned for pneumonia. Okay, so let me explain what this is. It's actually kind of a sad interaction. Uh, so this is age. We have three interactions with age. So that, that's age on the vertical axis. And this is whether you are diagnosed currently as not having cancer or having cancer. Okay, so these are the patients who still have cancer. And the surprising thing is yellow is high risk. So it's adding 0.5, which is a pretty big factor to risk. It's adding 0.5 to the risk of patients who are very young, 18 to 22, who have cancer. And for the most part, if you squint, it's not doing as much with the other patients. Let, let's just focus on this since this is the strong effect. So a little investigation. It turns out these are mostly patients who had childhood cancers. So they had cancers as teens. They've been aggressively treated the way childhood cancers are treated. They're not yet considered to be in remission to be cured because if that was the case, they'd be over there. So they're still over here. They're, they're still diagnosed with cancer. And now, because they're in our study, we know that they have pneumonia. So these are young patients who have probably, most of them, have had cancer for quite some time. It's been treated unsuccessfully so far. And now they have pneumonia. I mean, basically, things are going wrong. For, for these patients. They're, they're very, very sick. And the model is basically saying, you know, I did risk as a function of age, and I thought young people were great. Okay, highest risk was actually up here, not down here. And there's a separate term in the model for cancer, and it thinks cancer is bad for you. It adds like 0.6 to your risk if, if you have cancer. But it says there's an extra special group that neither of those two models together can represent. So we need this interaction, which is the special group of very young patients who have pneumonia and, and are still diagnosed with cancer. And we add extra high risk to them. OK, so we, we see interactions that are like that. OK, um, let's see. I should wrap up in soon. OK, uh, so let me skip the hospital readmission stuff, because I want to get to something that's more fun. Um, so it learns some really fun things about hospital readmission. A lot of it very similar, surprisingly, to what it learns for, for pneumonia, even though they're very different problems. Let's talk about, you know, bias problems, OK? So we all know, I mean, if you're in this room, that the bias is often in the data. It's not in the learning algorithm. And that if you train your model on biased data, then the model will learn to be biased. I mean, everybody in this room understands that. So in the trick for using these sort of models is what I said before. Keep the bias features in the data set, train the model, uh, and then look to see what's happened. And then if you can, remove the bias after the fact. Okay. I'm making this sound too easy, but, but that's the high level picture. Now, if you remove the offending bias variables before, remember you're sort of committing yourself to doom. Right? That is, uh, the bias will probably still be in the model, or most of it. You won't be able to detect it, and you won't be able to fix it. And this is why things like the GDPR rule, uh, so Article 9 says it's going to be harder to get access to certain variables, protected variables, like uh, race and gender, uh, because they don't want the models or anything you do with the data to be biased by those variables. And it turns out, if you're thinking the way I'm thinking, this is the worst thing you could possibly do. This kind of guarantees that your models will be biased <laughs> against those variables. You, one, won't be able to detect it or, or measure it properly unless you get access to the variable. And secondly, you probably won't be able to fix it even if you know there's a problem because it'll be spread among the other variables. So this is a, this is a worst case scenario from my point of view if you're actually interested in, in using models that are not biased. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, say it again. You might have legitimate interest in other GDPR tests. Yes, yes, yes. So certainly things like privacy and all that sort of stuff. I mean, I mean that's a, a different kind of story. I don't know if that's the kind of thing you're referring to. But uh, do me a favor. Could we talk later about that? Because I'm, I'm actually very interested to hear about this. Because we're now pushing hard to try to educate uh, GDPR so that they, we really think that this is a, a sort of terrible mistake, right? I mean, it, 
It just guarantees bias will live on. It's like the, head, uh, the ostrich putting their head in the sand, you, you know, ignoring the problem and guaranteeing the problem will still remain. So, but I'd love to talk to you since you know more about it than I do. So th th this would be great. Um, and maybe there's a group of us who are actually all interested in, in talking about this. Okay, but we have yet another trick besides just training a transparent model on this stuff. And here's, here's some questions like, is compass biased? Well, you know, there's a lot of papers that say, of course, it's biased. Is all recidivism data that we might use to train a model biased? Well, I guess we believe because the real world is biased, there's a good chance that most data is biased. Here's an interesting question. Is compass more biased than even the data suggests? So we're, we're going to look at that sort of thing. So here's the modeling trick. So we're going to train model number one on raw recidivism data. So ProPublica fortunately released a data set, as I think everybody knows, which has true recidivism, and it also has the compass predicted score on the scale of 1 to 10. So we'll train a transparent model like we've seen on the raw data on true recidivism. We'll train a separate model to predict the compass score. So that is, we'll train an intelligible model to mimic the compass predictions, okay? And I have seen other people do this, so those of you who are smiling, maybe you have done this as well. And then we'll do the real versus Memorex game. We're gonna, oh, sorry, most of you are not old enough to know what that means. <laughs> uh, we're gonna compare what was learned uh, from the true targets with what was learned from the compass score as a way of trying to understand what the compass model may or may not have learned correctly. Oh, <laughs> so, sorry, sorry, this is a, they used to make tapes, <laughs> cassette tapes. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, um, showing my age here. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Um, and, and just one problem with the game I'm going to play with the ProPublica Compass data set is we only have access to you know, less than a dozen of the features. And you know, Compass apparently uses 100 plus features. So that's going to make this sort of modeling of what Compass does imperfect. And we're just going to have to live with that. Um, OK, so I'm going to show you some graphs. And you're now equipped to understand these graphs. So let me tell you what this is. Red is what happens when we train one of our models to try to predict uh, recidiv uh, the Compass predicted recidivism. So this is us trying to mimic compass is the red score. And this is a, f a function of age. And green is what happens if we train on the true recidivism data. So there are two interesting differences between the models, right? They, they pretty much agree throughout the, the bulk here. Two interesting differences are, if you look at actual recidivism, risk seems to be even higher for people who are very young. And for some reason, the compass score actually drops off which is interesting. And I'll show you later, if I have time, we think it's because Compass is not well modeling interactions. Uh, so there's an important interaction between age and other variables. And then the other interesting difference is down here. Now there's a lot of error bars there that you're not seeing. Uh, there aren't as many people in the data set who are sort of age 70 and above. But it turns out when we look at the real data, it looks like risk actually does go back up for recidivism for the sort of entrenched oldest um, um, criminals. And the Compass score doesn't, doesn't sort of notice that at all. Yeah, yeah, and I don't know. Uh, the error bars are reasonably large, uh, say, past 70. So I don't know that I would take any detail like, like this. But, it, but it's, a, it's a good question. Yes? Are, are there still that many criminals in the data set who are over 70? There, there, there is still a modest sample size out here, yes. Yeah, it's, it's actually still pretty good. And this method, this uh, transparent modeling, doesn't have sort of huge sample complexity requirements. So, so it actually does, it's, it's just like logistic regression on steroids. It's not like a deep neural net. So it doesn't need hundreds of millions of training examples to do something reasonable. I, I'm not trying to say I know for sure that this detail is correct. Uh, of course I don't. Um, but it is sort of interesting. And if you do a statistical analysis on the data, you will actually observe that there does seem to be an effect like this in the data. Um, and then we're the ones who are modeling interactions better, we think, than Compass. So, so we think our model is actually more likely to have this correct than the, the Compass model. Um, so let me show you some others. This is a number of priors. Hey, the models essentially agree. Sorry, can you go back to that? Sure, slide? sure. So except for those two glitches, yes. is, is it correct for me to interpret from your curve that as far as you can tell, Compass is doing a pretty good job? A absolutely. Okay. A a a absolutely. I think the models essentially agree perfectly except perhaps at the two ends. Yeah, yes, really yes, agree. yes, yes, ab ab absolutely, thank you. And here they pretty much agree perfectly as well. It's a little weird that the compass score maybe comes down a little bit, but we don't know if this is, is real. It could be our modeling of the compass score given the limited number of features. That's a pretty small effect, so I wouldn't get too excited by that. It could be it's monotonic. Uh, okay, so I'm not so sure about that, but, but they really seem to agree on the number of priors. 
Here's a weird one. This is length of stay. And remember, the actual recidivism is green. And there's a lot of interesting detail for length of stay that's around things like half a year and one year effects. So, so there's lots of interesting detail that really just doesn't seem to show up in the compass score. So, so that's kind of interesting. I don't know what to make of that since I haven't done a sort of further detailed analysis of that. Is that but it, I, su I suspect that's exactly what it is. I, I suspect that there are standard sentencing guidelines for certain kinds of crime, and that this model, the, the, our model based on the true recidivism data, is picking up on these kinds of crime. Yes, I, I think that's what it is, but, but I want to be careful since I don't know for sure. This is interesting. So this is a race. So we have uh, uh, African American, Asian, white, Hispanic, Native American, and then some other category. And remember, green is sort of what the data sort of suggests. So it looks like the compass model, uh, these are small enough differences. Actually, it turns out a 0.2, 0.3 is not that small. But, but basically, it seems to think that African American is a little riskier than it should be. It seems to think that Asians are a little, res less, a little riskier than they should be, right, because it's up higher. It seems to uh, favor whites. It thinks that they're lower risk than maybe they should be. Uh, for Hispanic, it thinks that they're also lower risk. Um, and then there's this big difference for Native Americans that I don't understand, and, and then for the other category. Is so it's just, error bar issue or the error bar issue? Uh, yeah, yeah, it turns out there's enough people here that the error bars are actually kind of small. Um, and the error bars are kind of small there, but the error bars are actually quite large yeah. on Native American and, and others. So without the error bars, even with the error bars, it can be hard to, to study this. But I thought it would only you know, be fair to show it to you, even though it's not a sort of perfect story where I can tell you exactly what's happening. Yes? So all the plots you have here are from the Azure right? Not from like, like, these are completely different from the Right, right, right. These are all from the additive plot. They're not marginalization, and they're not partial dependency plots. I, personally, I'm uh, afraid of marginalization and partial dependency plots because the technique often shows you, sometimes shows you things which are not real in the data. So, so I, I found you have to be very careful with partial dependency plots and marginalization plots. Um, you see that, like, you know, that, like, uh, quick drop off at the end, and then it, you would see, like, some of the correlation effects might uh, be better shown. Uh, I mean, I like one thing that I think you might be suggesting, which is suppose we were to try, try all three, partial dependency plots, marginalization plots, and our models. And if they all tell a consistent story, then we might be more likely to believe that it, it's real in the data. I think that's a great idea, actually. Yes? OK, so this is uh, uh, risk as a function of gender. So it's interesting that the compass score says females are lower risk. Um, and no, no. Uh, Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, or higher risk. Right, right, thank you, thank you. Uh, my own bias is showing. So, <laughs> um, then maybe is warranted by the data and slightly inverted for, for male. Uh, and I think, again, that this discrepancy, if it's real, is due to uh, handling of an interaction that I'll show you. So here's that interaction. So this is uh, female and male versus age. The interaction shows something very interesting. This is a very strong effect. It basically says, for young women, you should discount quite a bit. You should subtract a big hunk of risk for, for young women. They are not as risky as you think. Um, it's also sort of showing this is almost homogenous color. I mean, it's not, but it's, it's close. Um, and this is for males. I think what's also happening is showing this is like add low risk to them, add high risk to them. I think also what's happening is the, uh, the model is basically um, more attuned to males since it's the dominant group in the data set. And I think this interaction is basically saying, OK, you got males covered by age, and you got males covered by male and femaleness. But now we need to do a correction, because you didn't model females very well independently. And I think that's what this correction is. I think it's a, an attempt of the model to fix uh, what it thinks about women, because most of the model is actually based on male data, since it's the dominant part of the data. So, so I think that's what the interaction is. Um, so this is a priors count. And uh, uh, this is female and male there. Sorry, I didn't, didn't label that. And again, I think it's doing exactly the same thing. It's saying if you're very low priors and you're female, we should deduct quite a bit. Uh, and if you're high priors and you're female, we should add quite a bit. And again, I think this is compensating for the fact that the age plots, the prior plot, and the uh, male-female plots are mainly capturing male effects as opposed to female effects. And this is correcting for that. Um, this is priors count versus age. It's kind of a classic parity interaction, right? Two corners go one way, the other corners go the other way. Um, 
Uh, priors is the number of prior uh, crimes that, that you've been. Right? Um, so basically, it's saying, you know, if you're young and you have very few priors, we're overestimating your risk. Because remember, youth is the highest uh, risk category. And we think this is part of that discrepancy that we saw between the uh, COMPASS model and the model that we trained on true recidivism is that we think part of that difference is actually showing up right there. Because our model can capture it there, whereas the COMPASS model had to capture it, we suspect, in, in the age plot. And then up here, it's kind of interesting. People who have a large number of priors, there's actually not so much data up here, but people have a large number of priors uh, and who are elderly, for some reason, it turns out maybe they're a safer bet. And I don't, don't claim to understand why. Uh huh. Ah, it's a great, great question, um, and I can show you some other work we've done on that. It, it's completely true. I'll just say it in thirty seconds. It turns out age is a separate feature, priors is a separate feature. It is possible to take everything that is in those graphs, make those graphs go away so that they predict zero, and put all of that information into this graph along with the interaction. And the reason why we don't do it is because it makes the model less intelligible. So th this is an over-parameterized model class. So it turns out we have our choice of what mass is in the main effects and what mass is in the interactions. Can't go the other way. We can't take what's in the interactions and push it all into the mains because they really are interactions. Um, so, but by choice, we put as much of the effect into the mains as possible. And then we try to get just the residual into the interactions. It, it's a great question. I can tell you more about this if you're, if you're interested. Uh, and we're almost done. So this is, a, uh, this is a whether you have a felony degree, uh, felony or not. And it turns out if you're very young and you're convicted of a felony, then you're extra high risk in a way that the model didn't account for. Even though it thought young people were high risk, it wasn't taking into account felony versus non-felony. Does it affect the age group or the quitting thing? Uh, there's a whole school to prison discussion that's been going on. Right? I mean, uh, you mean what age group is this? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I don't know. Does it, is there data below 18 in in ProPublica? I, I, was just, I was just guessing it was an uh, adult. So I, I think it's 18 to 20-ish here. Yeah. Um, OK, so, so let me wrap up. One nice thing about this kind of modeling is, you, I mean, typically when you look at Compass now, you know to look for gender bias or race bias or something like that. With this kind of model, you don't have to know in advance what kind of bias you're looking for. You just train the model. It does its thing. And then the model is so easy to understand that hopefully you will get kicked in the face with some things that look questionable to you, and you'll further investigate them. So that's really nice. It means you don't have to ha like have designed some statistical test in advance to look for gender bias, and then run it on your model, and then question whether it's right or not, and try some other test. Here, you really can just sort of train the model, look at it, and then hopefully it tells you things that are worthy of further investigation. It doesn't answer the, the question for you, although we often find there's a pretty strong correlation between what the model tells us and what subsequent statistical analysis tells us, because they're, they're doing similar things under the hood. This modularity makes the bias much easier to detect and, and to fix. And the nice thing is these models are so accurate that you don't have to feel like it's a second class citizen that you're using just for transparency. The model's as good as anything else on many of these data sets. So you know, if you've got your choice between an unintelligible model that hits an ROC of 0.9 and an intelligible model that gets you an ROC of 0.9, I mean, why wouldn't you use some sort of intelligible model? Right? It just makes everything else easier. These are not causal models. I think everyone in the room understands that. It's up to you to look at things in the model that look suspicious and then figure out what they might be caused by. The curse of dimensionality and correlation is not something we have solved here. That, that is still a, a problem. Um, these are only intelligible models if the features are somewhat intelligible. This is not a replacement for deep learning on pixels or raw, raw speech signals and things like that. I don't know what a, a function of pixel 1 plus a function of pixel 2 plus a function of pixel 10,000 would look like. Um, these things are not perfect yet. We're doing a lot of active research on them. But they're now ready for prime time. I mean, if you were thinking of using logistic regression for any reason, you really probably should be using this instead uh, if you have things that are not just Boolean variables. If you have all Boolean variables, this is equivalent to logistic regression. It's exactly the same thing. Um, OK, high accuracy in test data is not enough. There are always landmines hidden in the data, even though you might not know about them. You need something that lets you see those landmines. It's very important, I think, in a lot of applications that we can understand what we're about to deploy. Otherwise, surprising errors will occur. 
it's surprising that it's important to keep these offending variables in the model. The ones you're most afraid of are the ones that should be in the model. Uh, if you eliminate them too early, you just make everything harder for you and you, you sort of make the bias entrenched. And this transparency allows you to detect things you, weren't know, you didn't know to look for in advance. So it's very important. And if I had a choice between that and that, and they both had the same accuracy, while it still takes effort to look at this thing, at least I know how to look at that thing uh, as, a, as opposed to this thing. Okay, I should, I should stop. <laughs>